Hello and welcome once again to Marijuana Resolve. Uh, here we are taping at BCTV Studios in downtown Brattleboro. Today we have as our guest uh, Clint Werner, who is the author of Marijuana, Gateway to Health, How Cannabis Protects Us from uh, Cancer and Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, we know that the federal government claims that, um, that there is no evidence of marijuana being safe and effective. Clint Werner says that there are surprising scientific uh, uh, discoveries that tell a different story. And he argues that research has uncovered previously uh, unknown but significant biological communications and a regulatory network in our bodies known as the, as the uh, endo, uh, endocannabinoid system, uh, and, and that in, which influences really all of our physiological activity. Uh, he explains that the unique compounds found in the cannabis plant, the cannabinoids, closely mimic and supplement the health protective activity of our body's own uh, endocannabinoids, uh, which work to prevent and interrupt disease processes. Clint, welcome very much. We're glad to have you today. And uh, I hope I, I was able to capture the essence of <laughs> the synopsis for your, for your recent uh, authorship. Yeah, that was great, but thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is really quite an amazing field that has been uncovered and it's really amazing because it was uncovered in the search to find out how marijuana gets people high. And what scientists found really in the last 10 to 15 years is that we have this whole regulatory network running throughout our bodies that influences pretty much every biological system that meshes together to create what we know as health. And it's amazing because these this system has sort of communication portals located throughout it that are known as receptors. And these receptors are regulated by chemicals we produce in our body called endocannabinoids. And the great thing is that we found that the marijuana plant, the cannabis plant, produces very similar chemicals, chemicals that are similar enough that they can actually supplement the activity of these naturally produced chemicals in our body and enhance our state of health. Now the, the, uh, and it, the, that's uh, what we need to get out to let people know. The endocrine system, uh, which is basically overseen in medicine by endocrinologist, um, is that, what is that, is that the overall process that, uh, so that, uh, cannabinoids, endocannabinoids are part of the uh, endocrine system? No, it's a wholly independent system. It's the cannabinoid, endocannabinoid uh, receptor network in our body, the endocannabinoid system. And there are some similarities uh, because they both are sort of uh, communications networks. The endocrine system is largely regulated by hormones, whereas the endocannabinoid system is regulated by cannabinoids, endocannabinoids that we produce in our own body, primarily one called anandamide and then another one that's known as 2-AG. And the goal, the function of these chemicals is to communicate uh, positive health processes to our bodies and to trigger positive health activities and to interrupt negative uh, environments and activities that might get arise. In other words, to interrupt the disease process that might start in our bodies. So then, uh, the uh, the process that is a is this a mammal issue? Since you know we're all mammal animals, is it's not this is not really a human issue. Is it in the mammalian species in general? It, it seems to be, and what's interesting is that they, I believe they found cannabinoid receptors in certain sponges. So it seems like it might be a universal system expressed throughout at least a significant uh, number of forms of life on our planet. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> 
and I mean, obviously it's, it's something, something that, that no one knew about, no one had a clue about until really 1988 was when the first cannabinoid receptor was found, and that was found in a rat. Um, and from there, from 1988 until really about 2000, 2002 or three, was the process of mapping this system and finding out where these uh, receptors express themselves. Because initially people thought it would just be located in the central nervous system because of the euphoria and some of the other effects. Um, but then when they started mapping this, these receptors out, they found that they're expressed through almost every biological system in our body. The one area that they are not really uh, involved in and expressed in is the brain stem, which is why we don't overdose from cannabis because opiates have receptors there and you can suppress the activity of the respiratory system by using too much opiates. But that wonderfully is one area that we don't have to worry about with cannabinoids. They're completely safe. So then that's because that is one of the um, uh, prime issues with any drug use is uh, overdosing and the relative harm to that. So basically what you're telling our viewers is that, which of course many of us already know, is that you don't really overdose on, on, um, mar on smoking marijuana or even ingesting it. You would probably have to use, in fact, I don't think there is any ceiling that, that's relative to overdosing, is that correct? There was a suggestion when they had the hearings about uh, reclassifying uh, marijuana so that it could be used medically with Judge Long back in, the, I believe it was in the 90s, um, the early, the late 80s. Um, there was evidence, I believe someone presented that an overdose to ingest enough cannabis to overdose, you'd have to smoke um, I think 1,500 pounds in five minutes or a half hour, which of course is physiologically impossible. So it is physiologically impossible to have a fatal overdose on cannabis. Now, there are some people who have bad experiences because they ingest frequently through eating cannabis. They might ingest too much and um, get really uncomfortable, but that's a passing experience and it's not not a biological crisis it's more of a psychological issue right so that um, that the uh, by ingest, ingesting meaning that you actually eat um, the uh, the marijuana product in some fashion um, can be different obviously in terms of its psychological effect on you as opposed to smoking it they're, they're relative I can, I can tell you if, you, if I could just jump in with my own experience, I did eat marijuana um, years ago, and I put a small amount uh, in, um, in the middle of a, of a pudding, and, uh, and it was simply one of the best experiences I, I've ever had in my life. Um, and uh, I, the other, other time I ingested is when I, this was years ago, I was able to get one of the, um, I think they were called Marinol, I'm not, the, the, the capsule that you, you, you know what I'm talking about, that, um, that seemed to have a very uh, negative effect on me, at least in terms of uh, kind of rocking my boat type thing. So eating marijuana where I broke it up did not, taking this uh, little tight capsule that was a medical uh, pharmaceutical product did. I, I didn't care for that. Um, what's your what's your uh, background with with the pharmaceutical related marijuana product that was developed to kill off the medical marijuana movement? There was um, Robert Randall is sort of the father of the marijuana medical marijuana movement. He was a patient with glaucoma who fought the government for at legal access so that he wouldn't have to go blind. And once he got it by establishing the Compassionate IND program, he worked to get other people on the program. And this got him some notoriety. So he was contacted by a cancer patient from New Mexico, Lynn Pearson. And they started working together in the 80s to get research programs. Actually, it was initially to get states to provide marijuana to cancer and uh, glaucoma patients primarily. 
this was um, really before AIDS had hit seriously, but there was all that was beginning to come up too. And, and so what happened was a number of states initiated medical marijuana programs, but the government wouldn't provide them with marijuana, so they turned them into medical marijuana research programs, and the government was still resistant. They provided some marijuana to some of the states, but then they came up with this synthetic solution, which was Marinol. Marinol, Dronabinol is the generic name, is a synthetic version of pure THC, and it's suspended in sesame oil because you really need an oil emulsifier generally to absorb cannabinoids effectively. And it is imbalanced. It doesn't have, really, it's a, it's a very different experience than using either eating cannabis or smoking marijuana or using tincture because it's just one compound isolated and synthesized. And it just doesn't, it doesn't fill the bill for medical use. So we're really, we're, we're back to, the, uh, to what's best here, isn't really a pharmaceutical, but the, but the natural plant itself is, Absolutely. is more effective. Well, that, that's what we're learning through science and a lot of what I've written about in my book is that the plant is a complex of chemicals and working together they have what the scientist who discovered the structure of THC, Raphael Machulam, uh, Raphael uh, calls this the entourage effect because it's not just one compound that has biological activity on its own. It's several, a number of compounds in a sort of natural biological cocktail that come together and work together to amplify each other's activity beyond what it would be alone or even beyond what theoretically it should be together that they could really potentiate each other's activity and so we see this with the cannabinoids THC THC actually seems to have uh, better effects in the presence of some CBD uh, and then we're finding out that there are the flavonoids and the terpenes which also seem to have similar anti-inflammatory neuroprotective cell protective activity that supports and encourages the activity of the cannabinoids. So when you take something out of the whole and synthesize it, it's a much different compound than the whole natural product. Well, you know, the, as you know, we're faced with the illegality of marijuana and we're faced with drug testing um, and but yet here, just in this a, f a few minutes that you've been speaking, it's it's really clear that this pr that marijuana is practically a wonder a wonder a drug, and we can also know and 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 because I I want to I really want to get your your ideas about this that that it for people who use it not for medical reasons. Uh, but the, because, uh, you know, they come home from work and maybe they simply want to relax or, or, or they may be in a social setting or something like that. These are not medical reasons, but oddly enough, it seems like those who use it for social reasons end up having, could, having some medical benefits. Would you see it that way? And is to get this information out because science is on our side and it cannot be denied any longer that using marijuana is health positive behavior. I'm sorry the evidence is in. In my book what I've done is I presented the preclinical evidence which is largely done with cells and animals in a laboratory setting and that tells us that THC and CBD have powerful anti-tumor activity and what's more, not just anti-tumor activity, but anti-tumor activity on a number of levels, inhibiting the ability of uh, cancer cells to produce blood vessels, to uh, tap into the host's blood system to feed itself, uh, inhibiting the ability of cancer cells to spread, um, protecting the body from the rise of cancer by changing the environment that leads to cancer. It's like, it's like this incredible attack on cancer. It induces apoptosis, triggers uh, cell death in cancer cells selectively while protecting the he healthy cells. So I presented this data 
but because some of it is preclinical, what I've done is I've gone into the epidemiological evidence that's been done, largely intending to show how damaging using marijuana is, but frequently they do these studies and the opposite come, opposite uh, information comes out. They get results completely contrary to what they thought they would. One example is uh, Dr. Tashkin's study at UCLA. It was a state-of-the-art epidemiological survey that they believed once and for all would prove that chronic marijuana smoking is associated with a positive risk for lung cancer. They did the study and they found out that chronic long-term marijuana smokers have up to a 37 percent reduction in the likelihood of developing lung cancer compared to people who smoke nothing. There was a study in head and neck cancer patients. If you are a chronic long-term smoker of marijuana, you have up to a 63 percent reduction in your likelihood of developing head and neck cancer. And it goes on and on. The, the, a study that showed that binge drinking teenagers have significant protection against the alcohol induced brain damage by smoking marijuana, by ingesting cannabinoids. It shields the brain cells. And it, every day it seems that there's more and more evidence that cannabinoids from marijuana, from the cannabis plant, are supplemental to our naturally produced cannabinoids. And the job of our naturally produced cannabinoids is to maintain a vital state of health in our body. It's amazing news what we're learning here in, in science. So, you know, here and elsewhere in the country, we have this strong uh, battle between uh, the, the preventionist uh, people and the marijuana, marijuana consumer uh, public. And, uh, and it ties around their alleged, we want to protect our young people. Uh, they use, uh, they, 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 you know, they talk about the brain is still growing at 27, that the, that the, uh, that young people should be, uh, you know, uh, marijuana free. Um, and they're not just talking about like 14 and so on. Um, in terms of uh, human use of marijuana, um, is it, true that it's absolutely imperative that we need to keep it from our teenagers? Is there any lower limit in the age that, you, that you're aware of that, oh, we, sh we you know, somebody, you know, who is uh, under uh, 12 shouldn't touch this? Is, is it really that way or, 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 it, or, or are we being mis misled by the preventionist that in fact, young people aren't really that harmed by using marijuana in this in the way you might say alcohol is there are two ways to sort of slice into that pie because there's no significant organic damage that has been uh, proven in association with using marijuana by teenagers um, there was a huge hysteria I believe about a year ago uh, it seemed I covered in my book, there was a, the headlines were uh, marijuana much more damaging to teenage brains than previously believed. Uh, marijuana very harmful to, for teenage brains, these hysterical uh, headlines. And so when you look at the study they did though, what you find is that it didn't involve teenagers and it didn't involve marijuana. Uh, what they did was they took teenage rats, adolescent rats, and they injected them with synthetic cannabinoids, which are far stronger than the cannabinoids you find in marijuana. And the dosage is far in excess of what you would ingest by, you know, even heavy cannabis use. So you always have to look at how the studies have been done when you see really extreme um, hysterical headlines such as that. On the other hand, I write in my book that I really don't think teenagers should be using marijuana, not because of any organic damage, but because teenagers are a little less disciplined than adults. Um, they're not as focused and maybe not as, dis don't have as much discretion in their behavior. And if they really get involved with marijuana, it can sort of be a cul-de-sac in which they get into. And instead of uh, developing their skills 
and finding out where their innate abilities lie and really honing them and sharpening them up to have you know a great life to steer yourself getting the equipment you need to steer yourself to have a wonderful life that they can get over involved with marijuana and the good thing about that is it's not like alcohol they're not damaging their brains or their kidneys or their liver but still it can I think take them off course a little and I generally suggest that it's better for teenagers to wait until they're 18, 19, 20 to uh, start using cannabis. But I also say if there are teenagers who are using it and they're still getting good grades, they're still involved in extracurricular activities, they're you know in, involved in life, then it's not something to get hysterical about and throw them into a residential treatment program that's going to screw with their heads. And and I just want to say a lot of the treatment people are really uh, out of line. They're completely out of line with the way they uh, approach marijuana. I did a radio interview with a woman uh, in Denver, and she blogged about it. And the blog went up on Psychology Today's website. But there was an attack by uh, treatment people that had it taken down within eight hours. And uh, I had my book. Uh, there's a book distributor and um, he had it uh, displayed along with several other books at a drug treatment conference and they bullied him into taking it off the table and not displaying it. So I think that there's, an, among a lot of these treat, drug treatment people, there's a really um, irrational level that comes from a sort of greedy self-preservation. That's fascinating. Because the truth is, the the strata that we're that that are against this, uh, you know, law enforcement, um, the preventionists and prohibitionist groups, the treatment groups, um, all of these uh, people have an interest in keeping marijuana illegal and keep shifting people into either criminal uh, justice uh, into the now privatization of prisons big time or in treatment programs and uh, and they get money for prevention uh, groups. That's bad news uh, and, and all for a drug that you're pretty much identifying as something we shouldn't really be getting hysterical about. If we're getting hysterical about it, we should be getting hysterical about the fact that this is possibly one of the most promising discoveries in biological health in our lifetimes, at least since penicillin. And we have a government that has a policy in place that prohibits research into its benefits. That's something to get hysterical about. Exactly. It's, I mean, we, we have people... You know, I, you know, when in, in people you talk to people and you talk about ancient times and we talk about how the Catholic Church repressed knowledge that Galileo was trying to uncover his his uh, pursuit of knowledge and discovery. This, you know, we live in a time that's equally as horrible. The fact that our government prohibits beneficial research into cannabis is evil. It's wrong. It's criminal. This is the type of thing everyone should just be terribly upset about, mad as hell. I'm telling you, you think about it, people mock the Catholic Church and still throw stones at the Catholic Church because of what they brought against Galileo and other scientists. We live in a time in which our government is behaving in exactly the same way, maybe even a worse way, because Galileo was uncovering knowledge, but the field of cannabis science is uncovering knowledge that directly impacts the health of human beings. In other words, directly relieves misery and suffering and prevents it. And, it, uh, you know, it's enough to make you mad. It, I mean, and not angry mad, but crazy mad because it's just so wrong. That's one thing everyone needs to do is to contact your representatives and ask why in the 21st century, there's still provisions that prevent research into the beneficial qualities of marijuana. I, I'm really glad to hear you uh, bring that up because I just had a letter published recently about the same thing in different places in the state that we really don't have a reason based on scientific and medical and economic studies to justify why marijuana is illegal in the first place. 
Uh, and so, um, so then from that, uh, from that point of discussion, I'd like to actually jump to uh, a slightly different take because I'd love to know your opinion about this. Um, we have a strong medical marijuana movement in this country. I'm deeply concerned that it's going to move all of marijuana through the prescriptive process only and cut out the people who simply want to go and purchase marijuana for their own personal use, uh, medical or just uh, for social or recreational. So we actually advocate marijuana for an adult market along the alcohol model. Which, which then suggests that if you do it that way, its medicinal values are already built in um, and you cover everybody as opposed to funnel, channeling it through just a narrow market of prescription marijuana. Personally, I'm against the medicalization of, mar of, of marijuana. I'm totally in favor of uh, marijuana as a medicine if that's what people wish to do or if it's simply a social or or, 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 or a recreational issue that's fine with me also how do you feel about um, the uh, medical uh, how do you feel about marijuana being made available to adults along the alcohol model I absolutely support that my feeling is is that we need descheduling we don't need a rescheduling. We need to deschedule because there's just no justification for cannabis being in the Controlled Substances Act. It's far too uh, beneficial. The margin of safety is far too broad to be concerned about it. And I personally think it needs to be treated more as an herbal supplement uh, product with certain alcohol-like restrictions on age use. And that's what we need to go to. But as far, I have, do have to say, as far as the medicalization, um, I've been a big supporter of that because my perspective as the, the way we've come to this is we rediscovered the medical effects of cannabis after a broad population started to use it socially because there were some people who were getting cancer treatment who found it worked or like Robert Randall had glaucoma and then HIV later on. And so what, to me, the medical marijuana movement was a sort of form of triage. They're the first ones we need to protect. They're the ones we need to make it available first for first because that's just a humanitarian approach. You know, it's great to use it socially, but if it can save someone's life who's seriously ill or alleviate the severity of their suffering, that's what we moved and worked for medical marijuana for. But I am with you. I do not want to see it turned into a monopolistic prescription drug. I don't mind that they're developing um, uh, Sativex. I, I don't have a problem with the fact that it would be available for people who want to use it. But my perspective is that we need the social market for people who want to use it socially. And then we also need to have uh, medical uh, outlets sort of like like the dispensaries we have because people need guidance frequently on what type will work best for their ailment if they don't want to get high what they can use to get the cannabinoids into their system to pr improve their health and so I think we need to have some medicalization but I think that most people in the medical movement envision what we have here in California which is more localized production with uh, quality testing and safety testing and uh, product development by small scale local entrepreneurs. And, and I don't see that we need to be sending our cannabis remedy money to Great Britain or to Bayer Aspirin when we can keep it in the community. Well, that's good to hear. You know, Clint, uh, I think we'd like to have you back uh, on one of our upcoming future programs. Would you be able to rejoin us again to continue this oh. discussion? Anytime. I just, you know, I'm, this is my commitment. I took the Jack Herrera pledge to work for legalization every day of my life. Excellent. Uh, let's, let's, so let's hope that we can move more in that direction. Uh, we have Let about 20 share. seconds, and I just wanted to say, while you're looking at Clint's book, that on behalf of Daryl Pillsbury and myself and the other members of Marijuana Resolve, thank you for joining us again. We'll see you in our next program.
Thank you. Thank you, Clint.